I'm a New Jersey boy, even though I was born in Brooklyn, New York, I, I grew up in New Jersey. And this is my life history in about 30 seconds. Uh, I got a whole bunch of technical degrees uh, in New Jersey and the University of Virginia. I worked as a research so uh, scientist at RCA Laboratories. Now, probably only people with gray hair in the audience are going to recognize the name RCA. But at one time, it was up there with IBM, GE, and uh, all the other big technical companies. So I developed lasers and fiber optic products. I was kind of at the back end of what you guys are doing now. Uh, after 11 years, I started my first company, Epitax, which made fiber optic products. Started and sold that. Then I started my next one, Sensors Unlimited, which made infrared cameras. Sold that a couple of times. Went to space, and now I do venture capital. Now, <laughs> I'm going to drill down and, and tell you a little bit more about each of them. But the presentation is uh, its half about entrepreneurship and half about space. And another way of putting it is half is how I made the money and the other half is how I spent it. So, um, Now, uh, on the business side, after I, I left RCA, I had no background in business, no MBA. I never even took a course in accounting. I just thought I could do this better, faster, and cheaper, all this fiber optic stuff. I made some of the initial uh, detectors which converted the light, the fiber optic light, into electrical signals. So I spun out with about five people and one and a half million dollars that it took me two years to raise. Uh, stuck to our business. Uh, by 1989, we were five million in revenue. And by 1990, we sold the company for $12 million. Now, as a typical entrepreneur, I hung around for about a year and then left and started my next venture. Just as a footnote, nine years later, Epitax was acquired again by JDS Uniphase. I'm more proud of the fact that we had 1,000 employees at that time than the actual sale prices for all of these. So after I sold Epitax, I went and started a second company called Sensors Unlimited, which made infrared cameras cameras that see in the dark, kind of like used for night vision and other applications like that. And I took all the money I made from Epitax, put that into Sensors Unlimited. We also had military and government research contracts. Um, we slowly, from, uh, from 92 up to 99, converted from a research company to a commercial company. And once we found that these infrared cameras actually had applications in the telecom industry for multi demultiplexing uh, optical fibers, our business really took off uh, in 1998. Now, by the year 2000, a lot of you will remember, everything was crazy. That was the telecom boom, or the internet boom, dot-com boom. Uh, companies were selling off the charts. Uh, even though by year 2000, we only had 25 million in sales, we actually got acquired for a value near $600 million. Now, and that's how crazy things were back then, 16 years ago. Now, we weren't actually acquired for $600 million in cash. We were acquired by a parent company, Finisar, for 20 million shares of their stock. Back in the year 2000, everyone knew that stock was worth more than cash. And I think some of the folks with gray hair, I see them nodding their head. They remember those days. Uh, when I ran my company, when people came in for their annual review and they offered them a salary increase, they would say, no, 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 don't give me money. Give me more stock options, because that was the belief. All right. When we got acquired for those 20 million shares of stock, they were worth $30 a share. So you do the math and you see where the value comes. Now you all know what happened after that. A year later, the market crashed. And by 2002, everything is dead and dying. So we actually bought the company back for $6 million. Now you say, wow, that's, you know, what a deal. You know, that was, that was uh, you pulled the wool over their eyes. But the reality is, that $30 stock had dropped down to 50 cents a share. And you do that math, 
and $6 million isn't such a bad deal for either party. So we, but here's the important thing. We got our own company back, and we got to do the technologies that we were good at, and we went more into the military imaging side, and by the year 2005, I was able to sell the company again, this time for a more modest $60 million. But um, you know, the one thing I've learned in business uh, and in all parts of my life, the secret to success is three words, and it's don't give up. Right? Because that sounds like a nice, easy picture. You start a company and you sell it for a whole bunch of money. But during those years that I'm leaving out here, we had some really tough times. And I bet a lot of you have been through that. When the orders didn't come in, when you were struggling to meet payroll, when you didn't know how you were going to get through the next three months. And believe me, I had plenty of those times. And I always fell back on that secret. It's not about money. It's, it's not about smarts. It's about the persistence and the effort that you put into something. So um, let me give a little bit of history. Go back to uh, 16 years. And I mentioned things were crazy. The stock market was at a peak. High tech, everybody wanted high tech. They wanted stocks. Everyone thought stocks are worth more than cash. If you went to a conference like this, fiber optics, telecom, people would be out the door trying to get in. It was like a rock concert. Um, all the values went up. It was a crazy time. It's a good time to sell. It's just like real estate. When's the best time to, to sell your house? It's when the market's up. Most people do the opposite. When they see the market going up, like remember 2006, 2007, everyone said, boy, I got to get in on this real estate boom. I'm going to buy two, maybe three houses. And you all know what happened after that. So when things are going great, that's the time to get out. All right? Again, two and a half years later, fast forward, everything reversed. All right? Stock market had bottomed out. Stocks are almost worthless. Everybody wants cash now. Nobody wants stock. Right? Very difficult to raise money. Uh, valuations have dropped a lot. Good time to buy. Right? Again, using the real estate analogy, most people sell. All right? When things are down, I know a lot of my friends in 2008 and 2009, when the stock market went down this year, sold all their stocks because they were afraid. And the ones that just hung on and uh, did nothing, are, are doing very well today. So again, buy when things are down, just like in real estate. Um, I've been doing startups and entrepreneurship for about 30 years, and I've noticed that most things are cyclical. Sometimes money is uh, plentiful, other times it's hard to get. Same with people, facilities. But the one thing that never changes is what I call leverage. And leverage is the ability to trade off one thing for another. Here's an example. When I started Sensors Unlimited in 1992, now that's a, a semiconductor electronics business. And we needed uh, equipment that cost millions of dollars. And we didn't have the money. Just so happened a friend of mine, Steve Forrest, was coming to Princeton University as a professor. And he had most of this equipment, but he didn't have people to set it up. So I took my engineers, helped him set up his laboratory, made an agreement with the university to share our research contracts, and I got to access millions of dollars worth of equipment without buying uh, one penny of it. So anytime you think money is a, uh, an obstacle, always think there's probably another way around it if you look really hard. Um, one of the reasons for the success of both companies were partnerships. Uh, as you know uh, from I, the talk I just heard, uh, you have to deal with people. You can't do this stuff in a vacuum. Uh, we worked with all the universities in New Jersey, uh, with professional organizations. I'm a big fan of going to uh, meetings just like this. I probably do two or three meetings a week conferences or technical talks, because it's networking. I mean, the value of these meetings really isn't what's up on there. It's what's out there with all the people that you're going to meet. So uh, you know, as I mentioned, 
selling, you have to go with the market. Uh, you can't force it. Some people come to me in, uh, in high tech and think that because I was able to sell my company that I can just go and help them do it like I have some kind of magic wand. And uh, you can't force the market. But what you can do is be ready. You know, you can have a great management team in place, have a good team presentation. Instead of one charismatic leader, if you show up with five people, finance, operations, administration, you'll look much better. And the final thing is, you know, I have a lot of analogies with real estate and business. Get a good price. Don't hold out for the best. I'm sure you all know people that you know, got an offer for their house, and they say, no, I think I can get more. And what happens? They lose a sale. So walk away a winner. So after having done this for almost 30 years, you know, what did I learn? Uh, I'll go to my grave thinking that lean and mean is better. Uh, in all my businesses, now I invest in other high-tech businesses. You know, I want modest facilities, low rent, uh, sometimes shabby quarters, but what's important is what goes on inside. Uh, and the last thing, which is universal, hire people that are better than you. And that's, I think, the hardest thing for people in, to do in business. Often when they say, yeah, I'm, I'm hiring this person, I think they'll work out well for me, what they're really thinking is that, well, I can control this person. This person will do what I say because I'm their boss. And I kind of take the opposite view. Uh, if I hire someone, I want them to tell me what to do. Uh, and if you, if you go at it with that attitude, I think you can assemble a really good team uh, and let them manage you instead of the other way. Uh, and last point on here is about mistakes. Now, since I've been doing this so long, people often say to me, I bet you make fewer mistakes now. And the reality is I, I probably make more mistakes than I did in the beginning. The difference is I deal with them faster. And you all know you're in a, a very fast moving business. You can't often, this, you can't sit on a decision. You just have to make it. And sometimes you don't have all the facts and sometimes you make the wrong decision. I mean, it's just part. When you have to make 10 decisions a day, they're not all gonna be right. The important thing is, when you realize you make a mistake, go back and correct it. And that's the thing I think a lot of people, when they begin in a business, they fight and they try and make things work, work instead of you know, pulling back and saying, look, I went down the wrong path, let me turn around and go on the right one. So you know, in, in my stuff, even though I'm in the high technology business, it's not really about technology, and it's a, not about the markets. It's about people. And if you hire the best people you can find and work your relationships in business, should be successful. So after having done that twice, uh, now I do uh, what's called venture capital or angel investor uh, under my name, GHO Ventures. Uh, a few of the companies I have now Princeton Power Systems, they make inverters and battery backups, you know, energy storage, which is becoming really uh, useful now. Instead of just solar, now you can have solar with a battery backup, which evens it out. Uh, Achieve 3000 is one of my uh, successful companies. They developed uh, technology uh, that, that's used in schools to increase reading ability with kids. They started out in inner city schools, and the technology was so successful that they worked it up into uh, the mainstream public schools. Uh, power survey company, uh, they do stray voltage detection. They scan city streets and look for manhole covers and street lamps that are electrified, uh, and they identify the hazards. And, shock rates and even deaths from electrocutions have gone way down in New York City and many other uh, cities where the technology has been employed. Uh, finally, United Silicon Carbide is probably closest to my background. Uh, they make the next generation uh, power transistor. You probably know that silicon is used in computer memories and, and chips. Uh, and you've probably also heard of silicon carbide when you go to the hardware store and buy a drill. 
you know, if you want a really tough drill to go through concrete and so on, you use silicon carbide. Turns out the same thing is true in semiconductor electronics. Silicon carbide has much better electronic properties than silicon. It's also much harder to make. So uh, United Silicon Carbide is working on that next generation uh, of transistors. Amongst other things, you've often seen these big power transformers either sitting on a, a pedestal or up on poles. Silicon carbide has the ability to shrink the size of those things about a factor 10. So, uh, so after I s started and sold my two companies, I decided to go to space. Right. Where did I get this, the idea? It's a true story in Starbucks. Right. June of 2003, I was having a coffee and reading a paper, and I read this story about a company called Space Adventures that could uh, enable private citizens like me to go up into space. And when I read it, it was like one of these aha moments. I just, I knew I had to do it as soon as I read that story. So by uh, 2004, I started training in Russia. Uh, and I was scheduled to launch in October of uh, 2004. Uh, it requires at least six months of training because you know, I'm not a professional astronaut but you just can't hop up on a rocket. You have to learn a lot about the safety procedures, emergency procedures, how to put the spacesuit on. Uh, it does take a lot of full-time training. Uh, so I was in training for two and a half months expecting to fly that year, and life happened. I had a small medical problem, and they disqualified me. Problem, I had a small black spot on a lung x-ray, and it turned out to be harmless, uh, but within a month, the spot had gone away. My doctor certified me, and I went back to the Russians and said, OK, I'm ready to go. And they said, yet. Right. That means no in Russian. Right. Every month, I would go back with other x-rays and doctor's notes, yet, yet. And eight times, I reapplied. Eight times, they said no. And by the seventh or eighth time, I'm thinking, you know, this might not happen. But I just remember the words I always used about don't give up. And the eighth or ninth time I went back, I took my lung doctor over to Russia, and they finally let me back with about a pile of conditions like this, which I willingly signed. I got back in training, and I got to fly in space. So the lesson I learned at age 60 was the same lesson I learned in high school when I failed trigonometry. And that's if you really want to do something, and don't give up, all right? So um, having told you about uh, my reasons, let's talk a little bit about the space. I'm not going to read this off to you. Uh, but the space station, it's roughly uh, 240 miles above the Earth. It orbits every 90 minutes, OK? And there used to be two ways of getting there. One was the space shuttle, and the other was the Russian Soyuz rocket. About three, four years ago, they stopped flying the shuttle, and now Soyuz is the only way to get up there. So here is the Soyuz rocket, uh, and they launched from Kazakhstan. I had to train for six months in, in Moscow uh, at the uh, Russian Space Agency. So I became a student up at 6 o'clock in the morning, running, eat, classes 9 to 4, more physical training, dinner, homework, get up, go to bed, do it again. Uh, it, it was kind of fun, uh, you know, at age 60, being a student again. So after all this training, they take us to Kazakhstan in the middle of Asia. That's where Russia launches their rockets. So that's what a Soyuz rocket looks like. The white part is the actual vehicle. Everything in gray is a three-stage rocket. Um, this is me on the left, our Russian uh, commander Valery Tokarev in the middle, and astronaut Bill MacArthur on the right. Uh, the three of us trained together for six months. And this Soyuz capsule, I think I have a, yeah, there it is. It's roughly the size of that table you're sitting at, okay? So imagine three people and a ton of equipment all squeezed into something the size of uh, your table. 
Uh, it's really cramped and crowded. And we trained in a simulator this size for six months. We spent three to four hours every day. So, you know, we rehearsed all the bad things that might happen or that they thought might happen. And we got to know each other pretty well. We went from zero to 17,000 miles an hour in less than 10 minutes. Now, in order to do that, you have to really accelerate. And when you accelerate, there's a force exerted on you. And we had a force that was more than three and a half times the force of gravity, or three and a half Gs. And what that means is if you weigh 100 pounds now, you weigh 350 pounds under acceleration. The thing I remember is I could hardly lift my arm up as we were launching, because one of my duties was to be the uh, uh, emergency procedures uh, holder, and I had to turn the pages as we got to different stages of our launch. Um, here's once we got into orbit, now I say it only took us 10 minutes to get into orbit, but we couldn't just go to the space station. We had to make 34 orbits before we could actually dock. So that's what it looks like inside the Soyuz on our way to the space station. You see I'm holding a uh, Sony video camera, which is still up on the station, and I use that to take some video cassettes that I brought back with me. Um, Here's our docking at the space station. Remember, we're traveling 17,000 miles an hour. It looks like it's slow motion, but we're both traveling at the same rate. Uh, those are not wings, because in space there's no air. Spin, uh, wings won't help you. Those are solar panels that generate electricity to run the device. Yeah, here's uh, two guys were already on board, one uh, Russian cosmonaut, one astronaut. They had trouble getting the hatch open, as you can see. So we're on the other end. We also had trouble opening our hatch. There's a bell up on uh, the space station. It's a Navy bell. Anytime someone comes up for the first time, they ring the bell. These guys haven't seen another person for six months, so they're glad to, uh, to see the new crew because it also means they can go home. Here I come lugging my camera to take all these videos. Uh, people often ask me what was the best part of being in space. And I'll tell you, imagine floating weightless in this room. I mean, it's like magic. And I spent 10 days being weightless, and it was one of the most phenomenal things uh, that ever happened to me. Uh, I loved every second of it, never got tired of it, and if somebody called me out the door to go back, I, I would go in an instant. Um, here's the view looking outside the ISS, back down on Earth. Different direction here. And, and during the day, which is only about 45 minutes, Earth looks like a big blue sphere. A nice picture There's of the no world. obvious sign of life. Here's the Soyuz that I will return on. Top of the transfer chamber. And you can see not only solar cells, but you can see the arm, the robot arm. And another interesting view of the world. Uh, here's how you drink water in space. I have a water fountain in my left hand. Thank you. 
You'll appreciate why there are no showers and no sinks up on the space station. <laughs> Here's how we eat. Now, you don't go into space to eat. Basically, we had either canned goods or dehydrated foods that we would inject hot water into. That's uh, Russian cosmonaut Sergei Krikalev. <laughs> it's good. Okay, uh, here's a video of me. I was actually sending an email to my daughter Krista and her kids who are in the back of the room. Um, she lives down in Colts Neck, New Jersey, but we had access to the Tedra satellite, which could relay our uh, email messages back down to Earth. And you see just the force of pressing on the slowly keys. slowly disappears into all the storage containers. Presses me up to the sky. Took me a couple of takes on that one. Uh, and here's Newton's law of inertia. A body in motion tends to remain in motion. You just push you off and float to the end of the station. Some of the other observations you might have noticed, I'm not wearing shoes, because when you're weightless, you don't need them. Uh, and inside the station, we had, uh, we maintained sea level air pressure and a temperature of about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So that part was pretty good. Uh, these are the famous space toilets that you read about because they break down frequently. Uh, there's a sealed full one coming out and an empty going in. The guy in the flower shirt is astronaut John Phillips. He's been on board for six months, so he's World getting to go home. Astronauts. And astronaut uh, Bill MacArthur, he's the new guy, so he's at the bottom doing the installation. Um, Have a look. You know, even though it's weightless, the same stuff that goes on here on Earth happens up in space. Yeah. <laughs> Unstick any pipe with that. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh -huh. And there's the completed job. If you notice that uh, hose with the yellow funnel on top, both male and female astronauts use really that to like urinate. That. It's basically a vacuum cleaner hose, and you know you just turn the motor on, and the suction pulls the liquid in. Uh, I'm not going to get too graphic about the uh, space toilet. But I'll, I'll just point out two things to you. Uh, notice that the opening isn't quite as big as you're used to, so you have to think about centering yourself. <laughs> and, and when you're weightless, it's not so easy. Um, we do have, you can see on the floor there, that we have uh, uh, foot straps and also a seat belt to kind of keep us in place. And even though there is forced air going down into the uh, orifice, when you're done, you slam that lid as soon as you can, because <laughs> you never know what's going to pop out. Uh, uh, I often get asked, how do you sleep in space? And the answer is any way you want, uh, vertical, horizontal, it, it doesn't matter. But if you notice by my left elbow, you'll see there are a couple of strings. 
And those strings are used to uh, tie a sleeping bag up to a wall or a post so that you, you, know, you don't float around during the night and maybe bump your head on something. Uh, I found the sleep pretty restful because, again, if you think about it, when you're weightless, it takes a lot of pressure off your body. And also, the natural position when you're weightless is to sleep with your arms out instead of by your side. Uh, this is a camera that my company, Sensors Unlimited, made. And we did a video downlink to Princeton, New Jersey, so that all the engineers could see their cameras uh, floating around in space. Same flight suit I'm wearing now. Let me make one thing very clear. Check out Nothing inside. This is a box of the chips that we use to make the cameras. These chips convert the infrared light or heat into a video signal. Uh, I had a sticky, sticky substance on them so they'd adhere to the box. And I brought those back down and made cufflinks for all the engineers that uh, had developed the camera. Anyone who knows some physics will recognize this from moment of inertia, which is kind of the resistance to rotation. You see a book rotates easily about two of its axes. Watch this one. It doesn't like it. It wants to go back to those other two axes. You can do this at home with a notebook. Yeah, not stable. That's a stable axis. Two of the axes are stable and one isn't. I can't remember the reason. The unstable axis is going to go back to those other two. Yeah. This has a lot of importance with uh, communication satellites because they have to be spinning in a very stable orbit. These next few photos uh, are from NASA, and this shows what the space station looked like in 2005. It's quite different now because it's been built out a lot, but. Um, you see there's, there's one Soyuz pulling away. That's the vehicle we're in. And you'll notice another one that's attached to about the middle of the space station. And that's the one that I arrived in that's going to stay there for six months. And that's the escape vehicle for the two guys I flew up on. So that when we landed, the first thing I had to do was bring my uh, spacesuit and seat from the old Soyuz into the new Soyuz. Um, now, space is a vacuum, there's no air, but as we come down to Earth, when we get to, to where there's atmosphere, uh, going 17,000 miles an hour, friction with the air is going to heat things up. So what we do is jettison the engine up on top, and that habitat module on the bottom, which is loaded with garbage, old clothing, and stuff, and those two things burn up uh, when it hits the atmosphere. We are in the uh, capsule, which has a heat shield. So even though you know, all we saw out the window was flames and we're rolling and tumbling, absolutely no control, this lasts for about a minute and a half. And while it's doing this, it's also slowing us down. So once we reach about 1,000 miles an hour, we deploy a parachute and come down and land in the desert of Kazakhstan. Those flames you see there are retro rockets that we fire about three feet off the ground to you know, further slow our entry. Um, even though you know, we have the retro rockets, you do make a pretty big thump in the ground, as you can see that hole. Uh, we landed on our side. Uh, in about 10 minutes, the search and rescue team found us in, in the desert of Kazakhstan and pulled us out of the capsule. We had to be careful not to touch the sides of the capsule because uh, it was still hot from re-entry. Um, you know, this is what I looked at as soon as I came back down. Uh, first thing I did was call my daughter, Krista, in New York. Uh, they had a cell phone that we could use. Uh, here's the rest of the crew. Once you've been weightless for 10 days, 
you tend to be dizzy because you get disoriented, you know, your inner ear. It's kind of like when you spin around on a merry-go-round. So, uh, you know, they treated us like medical patients. Um, I bounced back in about three days since I was, had only been weightless for 10 days. The other guys took about three weeks since you know, they had been weightless for six months. Um, just in closing, some of the other things I do, I have a ranch in Montana. Uh, it's run on solar energy, and you might say that's great during the day. What do you do at night? And we have batteries. Uh, this is an old system using lead acid batteries. Uh, so during the day, when I'm usually not there, we charge up the batteries, and at night we uh, run the electricity uh, through them. With the new systems that Princeton Power uh, makes, they're smaller and they use lithium ion batteries. Uh, I'm also an electric car buff. I not only have the Tesla Roadster, but I also just acquired the Tesla X, which is a phenomenal car that, amongst other things, drives itself. You can let go of the wheel. And the best part, actually, is it parks itself. So when you get up to those tight parking places, you just press P and the car does everything. So big fan of electric. It's about one-third the cost for fuel. Obviously, the cars are more expensive right now, but as batteries develop, you're going to see that cost coming down. And I think within 10 years, almost half the cars on the road are going to be electric. So. Uh, I should mention that I actually was able to get the capsule that I landed in out of Russia, out of Kazakhstan and Russia, and it's now on the Intrepid Museum. If you ever want to go see a real uh, space capsule, scorch marks and all. The Intrepid Museum is in New York City uh, on the Hudson River. It's an aircraft carrier. Uh, if you want to learn more, I have a book out called By Any Means Necessary on Amazon. And uh, I'll be glad to answer questions, and thanks very much. <laughs> questions? So what did it cost you to get up there? All right, it cost me $20 million. Was it worth it? Uh, every penny of it. And it was also a bargain, because now it's going for $70 million. So. And, you know, I, I get asked that in schools, and wh where does a guy from Brooklyn, New York, come up with 20 million bucks? I tell him it's science and engineering, because I, I stuck it out with, with the science and math and started a high-tech company, and that's how I got the money to do it. Yeah. Sure. Yes, uh, let me give you the example. Uh, that Roadster has about a 200-mile range, and it costs me about $5 in electricity. It's 53 kilowatt hours is the amount of energy the battery can store. Uh, to go 200 miles, if I got 25 miles to, to the gallon in a gas car, I'd need eight gallons of gasoline. And even at $2 a gallon, I mean, that's $16 versus five for my electric. So it's, it, that part's a no-brainer. Yes? Uh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, stars are very visible. I, I actually have uh, photos of stars in the moon. I just didn't include them here. Um, you know, we're not, we're only 250 miles above the Earth, so the moon and stars, they don't look bigger, but they look much brighter because you don't have the atmosphere, uh, blo you know, blocking the light. And one of the things uh, about constellations like Orion that most people know, or the Big Dipper, you can usually on a clear night say, oh, there's the Big Dipper. In space, it's a little difficult because there's a lot of other little stars that aren't normally visible that you see, kind of, you know, obscuring the view. Yes? Did you see any UFOs? Did I see any UFOs? I didn't. I spent a lot of time looking out the window, but I did not see any. Yeah? Did I do any experiments when I was up? Uh, 
Huh? Yeah, no, nothing of that sort. I, I did some biological experiments. I actually wanted to use that camera that we brought up to image the Earth in the near infrared uh, light spectrum. And you can tell the health of crops and a lot of good things. For weird reasons, if any of you know what ITAR is, it's a government restriction on military devices. I was not allowed to bring a working camera up because of ITAR restrictions. So I switched from my stuff into doing biological experiments for a European Space Agency. Yes? How many private citizens? There have been seven so far. I was the third, and one guy, Charles Shimoni, did it twice. He, he was the guy that developed uh, Microsoft Excel. There was a woman, Sarah Brightman, you may, some of you may know, a British singer, uh, who was in training about two years ago uh, to do this, and for reasons I'm not clear why, she didn't go. But as I mentioned, the price has really zoomed up. Uh, the Russians aren't stupid. <laughs> Yes, um, that money goes to Roscosmos, the Russian space agency. Now, they have an agreement with NASA. The, these things are worked out. Either group, if, if Russia qualifies someone, NASA has to accept them and vice versa. So being as that the Russians said I was qualified, NASA had to accept me. Uh, and, and I did some training down in the Johnson Space Center, but I was primarily a Russian subject while I was there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, going up, it, mm, I kind of adapted to it easily. For, and you never know until you get there. Uh, I, I don't seem to be subject to motion sickness. Uh, the only thing I noticed when we went up is my face was a little puffy. You may have even seen it, like a reddish face in some of the videos. And that's because, you know, the blood goes up to your head. It's pumped up. And normally it would come down by gravity, but uh, it, it tends to stay in your face. And one of the offshoots of that is the body shunts, the body thinks there's too much blood and it shunts it to your kidneys. So the first day we're standing in line for that uh, hose that I showed you with the vacuum cleaner line. Yes? Yeah, uh, the landing can be anything. Now, our, our landing was pretty good when we came down. We had a thud and we rolled over. And now we have a special seat with a shock absorber and many belts holding us in. So ours wasn't too bad. My crewmates had a rough landing because they had a wind. So even though the, you know, the rockets can keep you, slow you down this way, if the wind is blowing you that way, you just have to go with it. So I think they had a 20 mile an hour wind, so they had a pretty uh, severe landing. Also, what can happen is uh, you know, if things go wrong on the descent, sometimes you can, we only had about four and a half Gs of deceleration. But some people have undergone up to eight if they had to make a special ballistic landing. Yes, we're all conscious. Yes, that's, it, you know, if, and it, when you launch, that's why uh, when you see pictures of launches, people are kind of perpendicular to the direction of flight because you want the forces going this way. If they're going from your head to your heart, it, that can keep the blood from flowing to your brain. Yes, we do wear a pressure suit. That helps, but the forces are still there. Okay, thank you very much.